European Commission president has demanded that vaccine suppliers in the EU fulfil their European orders first before sending any more to the UK. But the British government is confident it can maintain the supply of the jab without interruption. Joining us now is Community Secretary Robert Jenrick. Uh, Robert, you know, where do you stand on this? Do you think that uh, vaccine supply uh, will continue and we will make uh, that promise that Boris Johnson has made that all adults will be vaccinated by July? Well, good morning. Yes, absolutely. We are confident that we've got the supplies that we need, both to meet our mid-April target of vaccinating all the over 50s and those people with clinical vulnerabilities and the bigger target, which is that every adult has had their first jab at least by uh, the end of July. And of course, anyone who has appointment for a jab, either their first or their second one, there's no need to worry. Those appointments uh, will be honoured. But of course, we want to ensure there's a sensible and cooperative relationship with the EU, that there's no uh, drawbridges being pulled up, that medical supplies and vaccines can continue to pass across international borders mm -hmm. and that contracts are honoured. That's the commitment that the EU made to the Prime Minister and we'll be holding them to account for it. So how can you do that then? Because I'm sure you want to have no nonsense. Obviously you would. But, you know, it does look like uh, Ursula von der Leyen is going to carry on with this. And where are these vaccines that you're so confident we have? Because her figures seem to be very different, don't they? She says that, you know, 21 million of our vaccines have come from the EU. Uh, just over a million were AstraZeneca, the rest Pfizer. It's only 9 million of our vaccines that have either been manufactured in Britain or come from countries outside the EU. So is she wrong or have we got a stockpile somewhere if she does decide to exert her legal right and uh, hold on to them? Well, we've chosen since the start not to discuss our supply chains. I think that's that's the right decision. But I can assure why, why you... Why is it the right decision viewers, when it's the subject of such concern? Well, because we're, we're getting our vaccines from multiple manufacturers from all over the world with complex international supply chains. None of them are reliant on any one factory or any one country. What I can assure your viewers of is our absolute commitment and confidence that we will be able to deliver on the targets that the Prime Minister set out. So there's no reason to worry. The vaccine programme will continue and it's going to continue to be a world leading one. Of course, it is true that we've built infrastructure that's capable of doing far more jabs than we are doing even today. And so if we can get more supply, then we'll be able to vaccinate even more people and even faster. I, I don't really understand what you mean. There, I'm really sorry, them. I don't understand what you mean. Have you got something up your sleeve? Is that what you're hinting there? That you can sort of don't want to reveal to us because it might have compromised negotiations? Because I don't know what you mean when you say I can absolutely reassure people we're confident when it, there's, the figures are so different from hers and your position is so different from hers. Well, the conversations that we've had with the manufacturers all over the world gives us confidence that we have the supply that we need to deliver on those two central commitments, that all the over 50s will be vaccinated by the middle of April, plus the other people who've got clinical vulnerabilities. That's Remember, that's the most important thing because that accounts for 99% of the mortalities uh, from COVID. So they really are the people in most need of the vaccines. But then we also believe that we'll be able to get the supplies that we need over the coming months to meet the broader commitment that all adults have been vaccinated uh, by the end of July. So there's no reason to worry. What would be a shame is that the infrastructure that we've put in place isn't put to good use because we can't get even more vaccines in the right. months ahead. And that does require a sensible approach from the European Union. We don't want to see relations strained, medicines or vaccines not being able to pass across international borders, because at the end of the day, everyone is reliant on complicated international supply chains. And it would be to everyone's detriment if we get into a climate of vaccine nationalism. That's not the British approach. And so we are trying to work and discuss this sensibly and pragmatically with the EU. Um, Robert, tell us about your Supporting Families programme, which is basically a rebranding of the Troubled Families programme, which was launched some time ago. Well, that's right. We've had the Troubled Families Programme for many years now. It's helped about 400,000 vulnerable families. 
it takes an approach which is unusual, where you look at the family as a unit, you assess all of their needs in the round on the basis that problems in a family might emanate from another family member. You can't address why a child is performing badly at school without thinking about what's going on at the home. You can't help parents back into the workplace unless their children have got the right care and support that they need. And it's been a very successful programme. It's reduced the number of children going into care. It's helped more people back into the workplace, particularly single parents. It's cut down on crime and it's helped people's health and mental health as well. So it's one of the country's most successful social programmes. And we think as we come out of COVID, with all the challenges that that's posed to families, it's going to be even more important. So we're calling it supporting families because that's exactly what it tries to do. I mean, and we're setting out to help 69,000 I mean, families. The, the, I mean, the families definitely need the support. And I, I, it's so you know great to hear you supporting this scheme. I just wonder... You know, why you voted against free school meals then, knowing just how important it is that children are fed and watered and actually can you know, live their lives as best as possible? Well, we didn't vote against free school meals. We've actually provided a government programme that is ensuring you voted that you, you voted against free school you meals. You specifically voted against free school meals, not the voucher system, but you personally did. Of course, we now know Boris Johnson has made something of a U-turn on that rang Marcus Rashford himself to inform him. And I wonder if, in the light of that, you regret voting against it. Well, I mean, let's not get distracted on that. That, that, is, that was an opposition I don't, I don't feel it is day a parliamentary I feel it's vote kind of in the House of Commons. Well, the vote itself I'm talking about, not the issue, because the Why? issue is clearly very important. The vote itself was, was what's called an opposition day debate in Parliament, which doesn't change government policy. It's an opportunity for other political parties to make a statement. What matters is It's also is an opportunity for you to, to make a statement of your intent. I wonder if maybe you had to do it because well, respect, we you were instructed to do it. And now that there's been a U-turn, maybe you regret that. Or do you still believe that it was right to not extend free school meals? Well, I think tackling the issue of child hunger and poverty is absolutely critical. It's always been important, but it's going to be even more so with all of the stresses and strains that we've so seen sorry, on family life over the course of the, the pandemic. And, that and that's really what we're trying to question. do now with this new programme. I'm really program. sorry. I know you're trying to do it with that programme, but it's not answering one question. And also, this programme has been in place for a while, and in March 2020, even pre-COVID, um, poverty was at its lowest level for a long, long time. I think for about 30 years, actually, if my stats are... Uh, I remember it well, and that's even pre-COVID. So the programme that you're pushing out hasn't worked as well as you've hoped. And also, on top of that, it isn't really answering the question because it's about us having a sense of what your values are. And so, because you voted against that, we just need to know that maybe now you've changed your mind and, and whether you regret it and whether you, in fact, do believe in extending free school meals. Well, I've always believed in ensuring that children get the support that they need. The question wasn't about the principle. It was about how do you yeah. do that in the most effective way? And there's been a debate around whether that's by providing school meals outside of school times, whether it's through vouchers, whether it's through local council-led support. And I think we've come up with a good package now, which provides millions of pounds of support, both when children are in school and out of term time as well. The programme that I'm leading, that I'm personally responsible for, uh, has been a success. It's led to really significant improvements for the families that we've been supporting. I mean, just to give you a few statistics, it's led to a 30% reduction in the number of children being taken into care. It's led to 11% more of the parents, particularly single mums, getting back into the workplace. These are real improvements in people's lives. And the approach is very different to the I mean, way that government of, Talking of works. Um, you know, helping single mums, um, £20 uplift uh, was given for universal credit. Um, that's only in place until October. I mean, just a yes or no, uh, will you commit to continuing that past October? Well, I can't commit to that. That's a decision for the Chancellor, but that would is a significant help for the Would you be pushing uh, for it to continue? Help for would you be pushing for it to continue? Would you vote for it, for instance, if there was an opportunity? Well, look, as I say, that's a decision for the Chancellor. But what I am working on are programmes like but the this. Decision We're whether also to push ensuring there's for it more is support. For you, is for you, isn't it? Is it something that you personally would support as a member of the government? 
Well, I feel very strongly that we need to put in place as much support as we can as we come out of the pandemic, because I think we're going to find some really serious issues that have built up over the course of the year. Of course, there's a challenge of unemployment. There's also been issues with domestic abuse, family breakdown. And so it's more important than ever that we have programmes like the one that I'm responsible for, which do provide wraparound care for a very large number of families that are under strain, often doing practical things. I mean, some of the examples I've seen recently with this programme have been key workers going into people's homes, ensuring that children are getting mental health support, that they're working with schools, buying simple things like a washing machine for a family, helping to clean family homes, getting families on a better path so that they can have good care for their children, that mums and dads can get back into the workplace uh, and they can start to rebuild their lives. I think this is going to be a real help to families. And it does build on a broader package Robert, of support. Uh, you I'm mentioned sorry, some of the things to, like the universal credit uplift. I'm going to have to jump in now. We're just running out of time. And I know you've got other interviews. You're very you. busy. Uh, yeah, so Always lovely to talk so to you, though. Good to speak to you this uh, morning. Right.